Okay, if you will grab a handout back there and grab a seat, we are ready to go. Okay, with handout in hand, let's uh, go ahead and open with the word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we come with such gratitude and thankfulness for your exceeding abundant goodness to us this past week. Thank you for the way you daily meet all of our needs in more than sufficient ways. And especially thank you that we have today when we can especially gather together as a group of blood-bought believers and just study your word and seek to understand more of yourself, what you have for us, so that when we do go out in the world, we can be the kind of representatives who hold high the moral excellences of the God who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege of being in America where we're freely able to gather and study it. And we just ask for the help of the Holy Spirit that uh, he might turn on the light for us and just challenge us, convict us, encourage us, strengthen us, help us, whatever the particular need of the hour is. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, today we want to continue on our summer theme of opposite world thinking. Uh, that is God think. Uh, and as you know, we've been exploring the necessity of um, allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us as believers to sanctify us. And we said one of those key areas of sanctification has to do with our mind. When we get saved, we need to uh, really have our mind straightened out since it was not functioning properly before. And now uh, God is seeking to be at work to really help us. And by the way, um, I don't know if... if pardon? Pardon? Giving us a lot of credit. Well, um, as you know, this week we had VBS, and I don't know if you stopped to think about the theme. Uh, the theme was uh, standing strong in today's battle for truth. And as I actually looked at the, the layout of each day's lesson, even though I was not involved in it per se, uh, I realized, wow, this, these young people this week were getting, shall we say, a crash course. I heard some of them did sort of crash, but... Uh, uh, what I mean is a real quick class in, in effect, the very kinds of stuff we're talking about here. So, for example, uh, every day had an apologetics content to it. And, and notice how similar what, what they were being taught uh, is to what we've been trying to, to uh, grasp ourselves. Absolute truth is for all people, for all times, for all circumstances. Wow. I mean, that's God think. Man thinks, says, everything is relative, there's no absolute truth, do your own thing, etc. Uh, build a biblical worldview to stand strong in the truth. Remember the first lesson, we especially use the word worldview a lot. A worldview is simply you put on God's glasses, if you will, so that you learn to see everything the way God sees them. That's God think. Guard against false teachings and temptations. It's exactly what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn how to think as God does so we don't fall for error. Uh, be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. 1 Peter 3.15, we've referred to that verse more than once. Always be ready to apologize, give a defense for why you believe what you do. Why do you believe in God think instead of man think? And then every day they had a little rhyme of two, only one is true. Decide your side. Do right in God's sight. Learn to discern. Train your brain. And I thought, you know what? Maybe we ought to have an appointed jingoist in our class so every week, whatever it is we're stressing, they could come up with some little jingo like that that would stick in our older minds the way it sticks in the younger minds. And I know it sticks um, at least in some of the younger minds because I was sort of quizzing Evangeline one day and uh, what they were learning, and she gave me some of these jingles. Now, I actually had a sheet of paper where I did get them from then, but it was like, whoa, that little jingo did stick. So after Sunday school, if you want to just pat um, Pastor uh, Phil on the back and say, good job, you're, you're expert at uh, putting these jingos in people's heads, whatever. Let's just hope they were all the right ones, huh? <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's how children learn. That's how we learn. We get this little thing stuck in our head, and we just uh, can't forget it. So, the first five weeks in our series, we've, we've simply looked at a lot of background info. 
Uh, and also, we looked at how Jesus exhibited uh, God think, and, and the Bible told us multiple times we are to follow his example. Uh, now today, uh, well actually today we're going to have our lesson, and then Lord willing for the next two weeks, uh, we will have special Sunday school in that next Sunday, Lord willing, the Diachenkos, Steve and, and um, Katie will be here. They are missionaries in Australia that we support. The next Sunday will be uh, Stephen and Vicki King, missionaries in Germany we support. And so they will be uh, having the Sunday school hour while they are here. So today we'll have this one, uh, our Sunday school. We'll try and get everything done today so you don't need to put that sheet in your pocket and keep it there for three weeks, whatever. Uh, and, then, um, and then, Lord willing, we'll be, we'll be picking up later. Uh, so for today, however, we want to explore, as you see at the very top of your sheet, God think versus man think when it comes to this subject of God, okay? Now, I realize this might seem a little bit strange, but there is a human way to think about God, and there is a God way to think about God, uh, if you will. And maybe you're saying, well, is that really all that significant? Notice a couple of quotes I put at the top just to kind of get our intellectual juices flowing as we start. First, of course, comes from A.W. Tozer, if you've ever read him. It was almost like he was a prophet. He was saying things back in the 30s, 40s, etc., that, you know, you found uh, coming so true in the church in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and especially today. He says, a local church will only be as great as its conception of God. An individual Christian will be a success or a failure depending upon what he or she thinks of God. It is critically important that we have a knowledge of the Holy One, that we know what God is like. And then a Christian theologian, one's view of God might even be thought of as supplying the whole framework within which one's theology is constructed and life is lived. It lends a particular coloration to one's style of ministry and philosophy of life. In other words, the way we think about God, okay, if uh, on this plane of life, which we said just represents where we're walking, and our theme today is God, there's, it's going to radically differentiate the way you act, the attitudes you have, etc., if you are thinking from below or if you are thinking from above, opposite world thinking. And that's the whole point that these two quotes are trying to make. So, uh, the first thing we need to, to remember, and this isn't on your sheet, uh, but just, should we say, by in, in passing, uh, we need to remember that, I mean, this is really true with most of the, the theological subjects, but virtually we are shut up to uh, the Bible when it comes to knowing how to think as God thinks about himself. Okay, Because remember, when we, when we think of, of revelation, there is such a thing as you know, general revelation or, special, or, or um, natural revelation. General revelation or natural revelation, and that's in nature. And you're familiar with passages like Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, Romans chapter 1, verses 18, telling us that God has declared there is a God and he's a powerful God. Everybody knows that just from looking at nature, which means that's why everybody is without excuse. But in and of itself, that really isn't sufficient when it comes to understanding what God is like. You can know he's powerful. You, you can know there is a God. You can know he's powerful. But then when you start asking a lot of other questions, what happens after death? You know, why did this tsunami come through and wipe out a quarter of a million people? And you can come up with all kinds of crazy explanations if, if that's the only revelation you have. You can really, you can, you can say, well, maybe the God isn't as powerful as I thought, or he's not sovereign over everything, or maybe he doesn't care about people, blah, 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 okay? So really what we are shut up to is what we call special revelation or supernatural revelation, and that is from the Bible. And that is why it is so important, and hopefully I've sufficiently been able to bring it out as we walk through some of these things. That is why it is so important that we always go back to the Bible when we're doing God think about God to say, what has God revealed about himself? And as, as we're going to see when we talk about this, we're going to struggle with some of the things that God says about himself, like, whoa, you know, it's blowing my circuitry. 
Uh, my, my, my intellectual hardware can hardly h- handle this. Well, my comforting words to you are join the club, okay? We're all in that same boat. When we're talking about God, we are in a totally different league. It, it just blows our minds, but we've got to keep doing it and trying to repair the hardware, if you will, and, and just say, well, this is what God says, okay? So how do I bring that to bear on this subject of God and all this stuff I see around me? So on your sheet, uh, I have listed what I'll, I'll simply call four categories of man think as we start out, okay? In other words, kind of four different options that we have when we think of thinking from below. And these, of course, are simply my corny titles, if you will. Um, if, you, if you have a better way for us to grasp it, if you have better titles for me, hey, I'm not, uh, I'm not so proud I wouldn't accept that, and I'll correct it so if I ever teach this again, I can say Joe Blow or Sally Schmoes or whoever it was that told me uh, said that this would be a good title for this category. But I've just tried to bring some of these things together And in a very simple title, if you will say, this kind of represents it. So the first one there, under Roman numeral one, man think, uh, A is biblical gods of non-revelation. Okay? So biblical gods of non-revelation. So this is the first first, uh, man think. Um, These biblical gods of non-revelation. When it comes to thinking about God, man says, okay, this this is what we think. So, um, what I have in mind here is uh, the varied gods of the nations that were, shall we say, in Israel's orbit or in Israel's backyard, okay? Uh, Because when we read the, the, the Bible, when we read specifically the Old Testament, we begin to see a lot of these gods and goddesses named, and we see a lot of these different countries where a god or goddess is associated with them. So I drew our our patented little map here, so you help me, okay? Um, Generally, I mean, we could talk about Canaanite gods and goddesses, so we'll just put uh, C-A-N there for Canaanite. Now, let's walk through through these various nations that Israel was dealing with. Of course, up here along the coast, you had Tyre and Sidon, which were basically Canaanite. We would just generally, they're, they're lumped together under the Canaanite deities. But then if we go up here, uh, what, what country did Israel interact with up here? And this might be asking you a little too much since uh, it's not talked about as much in the Old Testament. You remember what country was up here kind of in modern-day southeastern Turkey area? Pardon? Yeah, Pat fell on the back on that one too. He's not only speaking to little kids, he's... Okay, Hittites. Okay, the Hittites. Then if we want to go over here to the east, uh, who is over here? just north and maybe a little bit east as well of the Sea of Galilee. Fred? Uh, Well, we're going to come to them later, a little closer home. Pardon? Modern, it's a modern-day country as well. Syria, okay, so we have the Syrians, okay? Then we drop down here. What's on the east side uh, of the um, the Sea of Galilee and right along here, the east side. Okay, Jordan, but what uh, what ancient nation that Israel interacted with? Um, oh, man, don't pat Phil on the back a second time after all. Oh, that was Gabe, I'm sorry, okay. Okay, Moab is down here, okay. Moab is here, but what's the other famous one right here? Ammon, okay, Ammon. And then as we keep coming down here, what did you say is south of the Dead Sea? Edomites. Edomites. And then as we come over here on the coast, Phoenicia's up here. Philistines. And then, Fred, what do we want to do if we go a little bit to the east and north? Assyria. And then what uh, country after them, after they? Uh, Babylon. Okay. So, I mean, wow, when you, stop and, when you stop and think of all these nations, shall we say, in Israel's orbit, all these neighboring nations and their gods and goddesses, many times there was an overlap where, you know, if you were a nature deity in one of these religions, maybe the name changed as you moved to a different religion or if you moved 400 years down the road. 
but basically that different named deity had the same function as that as that previous uh, god or uh, or or goddess. Okay, so when you when you read the Old Testament and you think about uh, the gods in the Old Testament, I'd, I'd especially encourage you. A really neat thing to do is you don't mind writing in your Bible at the top of each page where you find what I simply call God versus the gods. And after you've read the Bible through in a year and you go back and you look at the top of your Bible, you will be shocked at how, on how many pages you have this clash between God and these various ancient Near Eastern deities. And you can begin to see why God had to just constantly Harp on the Israelites. He didn't just tell them one time, now don't worship idols. Okay, I preached that sermon last Sunday. I'll never need to say it again because you got it down. No. He had to preach it every Sunday. He had to constantly be reminding the people because they lived in a real environment where all these other things, all these other things were pulling them to think and act about whatever the subject was on the plane of life the way that they looked at things and not the way that God looked at things. Okay? So, um, on, your, on, your quote, on your sheet there, I've, I've kind of tried to paint some kind of with some pretty big brush strokes, if you will. Um, but just to summarize what we're talking about, because, I mean, remember, there are, there are Old Testament scholars, if you will, that devote an entire life to just studying one of these religions. Uh, not just not just all ancient Near Eastern religions, but some of them devoted an entire life just to the religious, the, the religions of one one particular people group. So on your sheet, notice that quote: "The gods of the nations are impotent non-entities who cannot protect and deliver even their own peoples. The visible idols were obviously man-made. Whatever the invisible gods might be thought to be, they too were nothing more than human constructs." The alleged gods that the idols represented had no divine reality or divine power. Three things you might want to circle in the quote. Impotent non-entities were obviously man-made. They were only human constructs. And the point that, that Wright is trying to make here in this, this point, which is true, is simply that, I mean, the people who were worshiping them worshiped them as being a real deity, if you will. Okay? In other words, they thought they really existed. And, uh, and usually they would have like a visual representation for their god or goddess. And we have a lot of those uh, statues, etc., cetera, from, from our archaeological uh, work. But the point that God is making through these Old Testament writers is, is that uh, they are, these false gods are non-entities. In other words, they're not even real. They're a figment of the worshiper's imagination, and therefore they're not in, shall we say, the God category. Okay? And that's why the, the, in, in almost cartoonish fashion, as we'll see as we go through here, the Old Testament writers mock these false deities. Why would you want to be worshiping vanity, that which is hollow, that which you can't put your hand on, that which, which doesn't even really exist? Why do you want to be worshiping something that is man-made? And my, or my, my corny phrase for all this is they were simply worshiping cheap, plastic, imitation, handmade wannabes. Okay? There really, were, there really was not another God. So, so, so when, you know, even, even if God says I'm greater than the gods, it's not like God said, oh yeah, over here, if you go to this bucket, you can pull out another God, but I'm over here and I'm greater than them. What God is saying through these Old Testament writers is this other bucket doesn't even exist because I am the only God. I'm the only God category, if you will. I'm the only one that has Godness to me. And so all of these other nations were simply worshiping what, what I have termed here biblical gods of non-revelation. Okay, let's keep reading. Um, when we study the ancient extra-biblical literature, the iconography, pictures, statues, we find common characteristics in the gods of Israel's neighbors. What are some of those? And again, just think of how, how, how the, this differs from God think about the real God, and we'll, we'll get to that toward the end. Polytheism, go, uh, gods and goddesses, the gods had needs that were met by humans, 
They, these gods did not require exclusive allegiance. So if you worship me, that's fine. But if you're worshiping another deity because he's in control of something else, that's fine too. Their character could be good, bad, temperamental, capricious, violent, or sensual. And boy, do we know from their own literature exactly how that was. I mean, when you read the Old Testament and God talks about some of the things that would go on under the name of, of these religious rituals, it's incredible. But we know from their own literature it's true. They were limited in knowledge and power. They were cosmically bound. That's why you would have a God who was, say, the, the, the God of the thunderstorm or nature. But then you had another God who was the God of the, of the sea and the waters. And you had another God who was in charge of health. And another God in charge of the, the wombs of women and cattle. And another, I mean, they were just cosmically bound. They were procreative. They were gods who were supposedly born through the sex of previous gods and goddesses. And then they themselves would pick up a goddess along the way and have sex and they would bear some more gods themselves. They were fallible, emotional, engaged in daily routines, activities, etc. I mean, incredible, incredible what, what we know from not simply the Old Testament, what we know from their own literature, how they viewed their own gods. And so... Uh, that's why, as I say, God had to constantly remind Israel uh, not, to, not to kiss up to these. Why in the world would you want to worship a God that was that kind of deity? So I've given you some passages, just very few that you can look at there. Um, uh, and, and, and some of those passages are indeed great passages on um, God versus the gods. You know, especially like Exodus 12, 12, when the children of Israel came out of, of Egypt at the Exodus. Uh, and we read that when God delivered Israel, he judged the Egyptian deities because Egyptian deities were supposedly in control of each of those areas where God brought judgment. And God was saying, no, your Egyptian deities aren't in control of animals. They're not in control of insects. They're not in control of whatever it is. And so God was judging them, exposing them as being a cheap, plastic, imitation, handmade wannabe. Uh, and of course, 1 Kings 18, 26 to 29, we could spend a whole lesson on that. 1 Kings 18 is um, Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And when you read that, again, you just laugh because when he, had, when he told the Baal worshipers to cry out to their God to send, uh, to send the, the water, the rain, uh, I mean, to send the fire to light it, and nothing happened. And what did he say? Yell louder because your God might be asleep. But you know what? According to their own sources, their gods did sleep. Or he said, maybe your God is taking a bathroom break. We laugh at that, but we know that's how they saw their gods. Had all the same human type function. Had all the kinds of functions that humans do. And, and, and you know, every time I read it, I laugh as a pathetic thing because you say you know what those people didn't say oh elijah now quit joking with us what did they do they yelled louder they cut themselves thinking well maybe if our god's on a bathroom break or not paying attention we need to get his attention i mean they really believed that stuff they believed it so much they were willing to do that stuff yeah he, he egged them on because he was trying to show them their cheap plat of course, they didn't have plastic in those days, but we do. Cheap plastic imitation handmade wannabes. Why would you Canaanites want to worship that kind of God when you can be worshiping Yahweh, the sovereign God over everything? We all have to read some of those. Uh, but one, one, just for one example, Psalm 115, 4 to 8. I think, uh, Dave, you have that, right? Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so you see how he's exposing it. He's saying, sure, that statue you have has an ear to it and a nose to it and an eye to it. It's a, but he says, what good is it? It's handmade. Can't do anything for you. It's a pain. Like Isaiah would say later, he, he, he would say, you know what? Why do you want a God that you have sitting in the corner of your living room 
And when trouble comes, you've got to say, oh, no, we've got to get out of here to protect our lives, but we also have to take our deity with us. So somebody get the wagon, get your little red wagon. Will somebody help me load our God in the wagon so we can carry it off? And Isaiah with tongue in cheek says, what a God. That your God is supposed to be the one who carries you and lifts your burdens. But in effect, it becomes you have to carry him and protect him in all these vicissitudes of life. Yeah, and there's... An, and there, there's somewhat of a debate uh, because some people say, well, there's no way in the world when they had that statue they really believed that was their God. Yet, in reality, they did because to them that statue represented it and everything that, that their God stood for was, shall we say, in that statue. So that's why he can mock it as being impotent because he's saying, yeah, I, I realize this is just a stone that you got from somewhere, a quarry. But in reality, this stone represents the power of your God, the majesty of your God and all that. And all that supposed reality behind it is not there. It's as dead as this is. Yeah, right. Good, good point. Okay, so that's, that's our first biblical God of non-revelation um, that we have. Secondly, okay, um, cultic gods... Or by cultic gods, I mean the way that cults would think about God. Okay, so this is simply our uh, this is our, simp- our our second way of man think, the way cults think of their gods. It's it's all it's basically man made. Now, granted, they might take a few realities of what God has revealed, but then they just totally pervert it. They totally they totally skew it. And of course, one of the reasons they're They're called a a cult is because they're messed up when it comes to uh, major Christian teaching. And of course, uh, when when you study cults, you find that that in reality, there are four major areas, if you will, where they really blow it. And and if you remember like my doctrinal pyramid, when we talk about, you know, um, doctrines being a pyramid down here, you have bibliology, everything stands or falls on what God has said. And then you have theology proper, and then you have uh, Christology, and then you go up here a little bit farther and you have uh, salvation, soteriology. Those are four key areas where you can be assured cults are going to blow it, and that's what makes them cults. Because they, they add to, they delete, they pervert God's revelation. They have a very skewed picture of God. Naturally, that means they're also really wacky when it comes to Christ. And, of course, how can a person be right with God's salvation? So, so we find that with, with these cults. And so on your sheet, uh, I have listed uh, for you some, just some real uh, more popular or, or, or cults you've probably heard of, like Christian Science with Mary Baker Eddy, Ekenkar, which they claim to be the most ancient religion known to man, really weird stuff about God, um, Jehovah's Witnesses, Charles Taze Russell, and of course the Church of Jesus Christ of uh, Latter-day Saints. And since we're more f- most familiar probably with, with LDS, I mean, you just think of, you know, the fact that they, they have God was once a man. Um, they have, you know, plurality of, of gods. They have a heavenly father and a heavenly mother. And of course they say, well, well it's only logical, it's only reasonable there's a heavenly mother. Because how do you produce children? A male and a female have to come together. So how are you going to have these spirits produced, etc., if you don't have a male and a female coming together? And, of course, the book of Genesis says man is created in the image of God. So you have men created in the image of Heavenly Father. They say women were created in the image of Heavenly Mother, etc. So, I mean, you can go on and on, but that's, that's the whole point with cultic ways of thinking about God. They are just totally skewed. They are just totally contrary to what God uh, himself has has said. Third one, liberal theology's God. Okay, Uh, this is another way of thinking from below or thinking um, as the world would think. Liberal theology's view of God. And uh, this is a real mixed bag, okay? 
And so as you're going to see, if you want to change some of the things that I have in C and then in D, when we get there to the contemporary man think about gods, um, you, you, might, you might say, well, I think one of them, I'd rather switch categories. Well, that's fine with me. You have a right to be wrong if you want to. But I mean, uh, that's fine with me because these categories can be pretty fluid, etc. cetera. Uh, but, it, but in liberal theology, um, there are people in America who would claim to be religious, who fit here. There are entire denominations that deny biblical teaching or fundamental doctrines. Okay? In fact, it's very interesting. Exactly 100 years ago this year, back in 1923, uh, an individual named J. Gresham Machen, Greek students, do you hear something ringing in your head? Bells, whistles. The book. The book. What's the book? The Greek grammar, okay. J. Gresham Machen wrote a very famous, or he wrote a Greek grammar that has been, been used, and it is still used, and that's actually what, what we're using here for, for our people who are studying it. But he wrote another book entitled Christianity and Liberalism, okay? 100 years old this year. Um, this was a time in church history where there was a so-called modernist controversy, where you, where you began to have... Uh, individuals and churches and cemetery, uh, seminaries, I often confuse those words, uh, throwing off all the Christian teaching. In other words, they were, they were just, just getting rid of them and they, were, and they were changing what had been taught for a couple thousand years. And Machen, who was a professor at Princeton in those days, saw this and he said, this is not right. Because they were saying, well, we're just tweaking it a little bit. It still is Christianity. And in Christianity and liberalism, his whole argument was, this is an entirely different system. This is not just tweaking it a little, putting on silver doorknobs instead of gold ones, uh, et cetera, carpet instead of linoleum. This is a completely different religion. Uh, and it is a masterful book that is incredibly applicable today for people. And of course, as a result of so much of this liberalism, he eventually, years later, left Princeton and helped found uh, you've probably heard of Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was one of the original founders of it. Okay? And so I put a quote on your sheet there where he says, The chief modern rival of Christianity is liberalism. At every point, the two movements are in opposition. In other words, liberal theology's God, liberal theology's teaching is not just slight differences to what Christianity is all about. It's an entirely different boat. It's an entirely different God that they are trying to worship. Well, and on your sheet, I've also, as I would put this under the category as well, uh, I've also listed a quote, prob a pretty famous quote, I guess, from probably the world's most outspoken uh, atheist today, a guy named um, Richard Dawkins. And this is really just a representative sample uh, uh, this, this quote of the way people today will attack God or demean God or blaspheme God. And this is, what, um, this is what he said. The God of the OT is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. Remember, he's talking about God. A vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Don't you wish he'd have told you what he really thinks? Yeah. That's how he looks at God, and if you've ever read any of his stuff, you can see how he, how he develops that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, believe it or not, there are enemies, if you will, within the church... Why do they have an opinion of God when, they're, when they don't even think there's a God? That's a, that's a, a really good question, and it's, it really makes, it, makes them look foolish. But they also see it as we've got to protect people who think there is a God, and we've got to expose it so they can, they can really join our camp. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, there, there, there are people actually within the church, 
if you will, and I'll, I won't give any names here, but, but, um, but there are uh, pastors, there are theologians, etc., who actually have written books who basically go along with what he is saying there, and they just are apologizing for this God of the Old Testament that he, he, was, he was, you know, and they use some of these phrases like here that, that Dawkins uses, and yet they're supposedly in good standing in evangelicalism. I mean, it is, it is sick, but this is liberal theology's way of looking at God. So as Roger Olson says, uh, revising the traditional Christian doctrine of God has been a major project of modern liberal Christian theology. Probably no single subject has consumed so much attention in the literature of liberal theology. And in his book there, he actually, uh, since he is a more conservative theologian, he actually just goes through basically every doctrine and he shows how liberal theology just tears it apart. It's just total man think. This is what we think God should be like. This is what we think salvation should be like. This is what we think the Bible should be like, etc. And then I'd also include here uh, Humanist Manifesto 2's famous phrase, as non-theists we begin with humans, not God, nature, not deity. And finally, the fourth, the last one of these negatives here uh, is what I would all simply call contemporary man-think gods, okay? So simply, and I realize the, the, uh, the liberal thing we looked there at there is pretty contemporary, if you will, but now I'm, I have more in, my, my thought here is more of, um, should we say, this is, is perhaps more the attitude of the man on the street, per se, in other words, when you just talk to an average person who's unsaved, or maybe they would even claim to be a Christian, um, but if you ask them about God, uh, they would probably give you some of these very same sentiments that we're going to see here from some of these, these quotes. So, I would put, I would put here a, uh, a quote from like a, a, a German theologian from, um, oh, probably 100 years ago now or so, he said, God will forgive me. That's his job. Just a very cavalier, casual, if you will, approach to deity. It's like God is here to be my errand boy. So, of course, I do what I want to do and he will forgive me. Isn't that what God is for? Well, think of how many people there are that we rub shoulders with every day who's, who really have such a cavalier attitude about God. Uh, or Feuerbach, man, the great projector, God, the great projection. In other words, with this, basically, God is whatever you want him to be. Because it's almost like, shall we say, this whiteboard would be the screen, and I simply, you know, get back there with the electronic equipment, and I say, what would I like God to be like? Oh, here's what I think God should be like. And that, it's always amazing that people in this category project on the screen exactly what they're like with all their foibles. So I would simply project on the screen and say, here's what God is really like. So I become the great projector and, and, and project it. And God simply is a God, if you will, who is in my image. And then Psalm 14.1 and uh, 53.1, both those psalms are almost identical. Uh, the first verse in each one starts out, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Um, as I put on your, your sheet here, the quote, the emphasis lies not upon a theoretical denial of his existence. In other words, that verse is not saying the fool says in his heart, I'm an atheist. No, that's really not uh, the point. But rather, it is a practical disregard of his lordship. The fool here does not know God in that he simply shuts God out of his life. He acts as if God did not exist. But he is not an atheist. Or as I put here, as we would say today, what does God have to do with it? In other words... You know, if somebody's going to do something and you say, well, I don't know if, that's, if, that, if that would be moral or if that would be right or if that would whatever, what does God have to do with it? In other words, it's just a matter of, as I think about God down here, in effect, I'm, I'm my own God. I make the choices I want to make. I don't bring God thoughts into my life to answer these great questions. Uh, Jeremiah 5.12 is, is uh, pretty difficult. But as you see in your sheet there, uh, well, it, 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 um, uh, it, it says they act deceptively against the Lord and they say, not he. 
I mean, that's literally what the Hebrew says. Uh, not he is what they say. So you're saying, huh, what is that all about? Uh, well, generally, it, 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 it's generally agreed that, that the, the point that's being made is they're saying God is not relevant. In other words, they do their own thing. And, and think of the whole context of Jeremiah uh, with, with false prophets telling the people God's not going to judge you. You know, you know more than God about this. You can do this and get away with it. And so he says these people act very deceptively and then they simply come along and say, God is not relevant. Uh, I mean, what, would, what, what does God have to do with this? How, how is God going to bring judgment upon us for something that we want to do and we think it's okay to do? And then Psalm 10, especially verses 3 to 13, um, where the, the, it begins with the godly man crying out, saying, in effect, God, where are you? Uh, I am struggling so much as I see wickedness abounding and it doesn't seem like you care. It doesn't seem like you're doing anything about it. And then there's some very telling comments in the heart of the paragraph before we get to the bottom and there's the, the end of the chapter and there's resolution. But a, a couple of them, as I put there uh, on your sheet, are um, this proud, self-sufficient individual, verse 4. Uh, it says, God is not in all his thoughts. The King James Version, actually, I think New American Standard or like Legacy Standard Bible um, are, are more accurate here where it says, all of his thoughts are, there is no God. And again, this, this, the evil person here, the wicked person, is not denying there is a God. He's not an atheist. But he is basically, again, simply ridiculing the, the fact that God would even care about human behavior. God's not relevant to this. What, why do you think God would be concerned with that? And then you continue, and it says, verse 6, he says, I won't be moved or shaken. In other words, I can think this way, and, and I'm, I'm going to be solid as ever. I'm, I'm never going to have any bad thing happen to me. What could God do to me? Verse 11, he says, God forgot. God hides his face. God won't see what I, what I do. I can, I'm getting away with it. And then in verse 13, he says, God won't require any reckoning from me. In other words, God is not sovereign over this. He's not a judge who's going to eventually judge me for it. Well, again, we could multiply our, we could multiply our examples here, but hopefully you, you get kind of an idea and you see just how many ways, shall we say, it is for a person to engage in man think, to have wrong views about God. So what God, what the Holy Spirit is trying to do with every one of us on a daily basis is bring us back to the point that as we're walking this plane of life and the nitty gritties of life, the rough and tumble of daily living with all of its challenges, etc., comes, comes upon us, that whenever we think of all how we're going to respond to it, we say, how would God think about this concerning who God really is in this situation? Because when something happens, maybe my first thought is, well, God's not in control of the situation. I've got to take it upon myself and do what I want to do because God, God's not going to do anything. Oop, wait a minute, Royce. Your God think is all wrong. That sounds like man think when it comes to God. God is in control of this situation. And we can go on and on with all the different things that happen. And if we're not careful, we, we attribute some pretty, some pretty sorry things to God. Uh, by the way we respond and so instead of saying, wait a minute, you know, I don't, I don't know why God is doing this. I can't understand all this kind of stuff, but let's go back and let me think what God, uh, what, what God tells me about himself. He's a God who loves. He's a God who cares. He's a God who's in control, you know, right down the list. So God think or God from above, Roman numeral two, uh, three key summary terms to keep in mind here, first of all, God is unique. Uh, using the word here in the sense of which there is only one having no like or equal or parallel. None of the myriads of so-called gods which have been promoted throughout human history have existed outside of their inventor's imagination and all their exciting ex exploits can safely be filed away as fairy tales. So I, I didn't put that quote on the sheet, I think, because we're running out of space, but... But God is unique. He is in a class all by himself. Okay? Second key word, incomparable. He is beyond the comparison. Uh, like Psalm 86, 8, there is none like you, O God. Psalm 89, 6, who can be compared to you? Who can be likened to you? 
Exodus 15, the children of Israel's song at the sea after the Exodus deliverance. Who is like unto you among the gods? Etc. That's a rhetorical question. Remember, rhetorical questions don't expect an answer from you. You can turn them around because they're actually exclamatory sentences. So when the people said, Who is like unto you, O Lord, among the gods? What they were really saying was, There is nobody like our God who is so awesome in what he does, who is so perfect in his character, etc. Uh, we have Isaiah chapter 40, verses 18 and 25, which Dan is going to read for us, right? Okay, so uh, there are multiple verses in the Bible where you have that, those expressions, who is like God, who can you compare to God, etc. And each time the, the writer's whole emphasis is, there is nobody to compare to God. There is nobody you can like to God because there's only this one category of Godness, if you will, and God's the only one in that box. And so therefore, he cannot be compared to any others. And as this old Puritan writer Swinnock said, uh, the doctrine that God is incomparable is useful to God's people by way of comfort. When we take the incomparable God as our God, we are incomparably blessed. And in fact, his entire book deals with uh, God's incomparable being, God's incomparable attributes, God's incomparable works, and God's incomparable words. Third key thing, third key term here is incomprehensible. Uh, on the one hand, the word can mean to grasp something in totality with the negative prefix on the front. So if it's incomprehensible, it simply means you cannot grasp this in its totality. And of course, that is true of God. There is always something more to God than what you can put your hands on and totally grasp. But the term can also be used to mean ungraspable or unknowable beyond all our conception. So I put the quote on your sheet. This doesn't mean God is unintelligible, like a logical contradiction, but it does mean God is, in some sense, supra-intelligible. He is outside the boundaries of what would otherwise count for intelligibility. He is radically incomprehensible. So those are three key things to think about when we, we, we have God think, if you will, uh, about, about God. And then a couple of summary verses like Job 26, 14. Job 26 is where Job has just been talking about uh, God's incredible power, especially in nature and the way he runs the universe. And then when he gets to verse 14, he says, Behold, these are just the fringes of God's ways. Or some translations might say the outskirts of God's ways or the extremities of God's ways. In other words, all this power that we see it's almost like, if you will, it's just a footnote about what God is really like, the amount of power he has and the control that he really, he really has. And then, this, likewise, in Romans 9 to 11, one of the deepest theological passages in the Bible concludes with the doxology in verses 33 to 36, where he says, God's judgments are unsearchable, they're unfathomable, and his ways are past finding out. I love that Greek word because it's a word that basically, as I, as I guess I put there on your sheet, means you can't track it down. And for those of you who are hunters, maybe the best or the closest illustration would be, it's like you're out there tracking a, a, a big game and you see these footprints or you see signs and you follow them and you say, I think we're getting closer to that big moose that I've waited all my life to get. And all of a sudden, it's like you lose everything. No more prints in the snow. No more things where you see this that big animal rubbed against any of the, sh the shrubs or anything. It's just you can't track it out. You can only go so far, and then it's like, wow, it's like I hit a dead end here. There's, there's just no more. It's just too great for me. I can't, I can't track it any farther. And it says, such it is with the ways of God. So we could say with Isaac Newton, what we know is a drop. What we don't know is an ocean. And perhaps the... The uh, percentages between the two should be even greater than that, okay? But I think you get the, we get the point. Now, when we think then, last of all, about God think, I mean, there are so many ways uh, we could approach this, but I've, I've 
pretty much just given you two in summary here. The first is what we might call categories or terms to identify God. And you could basically go to any systematic theology book and just dig out stuff on your own and say, okay, what are some really key things about God that I need to always keep in my mind? Well, I think John Blanchard in his book, Does God Believe in Atheists? And if you need something to read on a cold, rainy summer afternoon, uh, that's a good book to have. 600 pages or so, so it should occupy your entire afternoon. But uh, wealth of information. Um, but he, he lists 14 things there that are, shall we say, a minimum when you do God think. He doesn't use the term God think, but they're, 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 they're what you need to remember is true of God. So very quickly, first of all, God is unique. The Bible here is not saying that other gods are inferior or less attractive or less influential. What the Bible is saying, as we said before, is they're all just inventions. There really is no uh, other God. Personal, God is not a thing, power, influence, principle, or concept. He has all the essential characteristics of personality. So he is not just some stone or rock out there, but he is a personal God, and that's why he can interact with personal human beings. Number three, plural. God exists as a trinity of distinguishable persons. Notice I didn't say plurality of gods like the cults would, but plural. In other words, God revealed himself as trinity. And if you say, but Royce, give me some good illustrations. I don't get it. I say, we need to hurry on because I don't totally get it either. I know it's true, but there really are no good illustrations or examples to use because there's nothing else uh, out there that is like that. Okay. And by the way, as most writers will say, this is probably the most profound thing about God that he has revealed about himself that people are going to stumble over. But it just shows you how they basically say, well, I have to be able to explain everything about God, and if I can't explain it, it can't be true. And right there, they've just shot themselves in the foot, the head, wherever, because they're saying, I really don't want a God who's greater than me. I want, I, I want God to be like I am, and I need to project myself on him. Number four, spiritual, God does not have a body or any physical or material dimensions. Eternally self-existent, he is eternal, beyond origin, completely independent of anything and everything else. Transcendent, he is over and above time, space, and all finite reality. Now, this does not mean God is remote because a couple hundred years ago there was, there was a whole movement even in literature, et cetera, et cetera, well, God is so transcendent, he's out there, but he doesn't care about us down here. That's not what transcendence means, okay? God is not remote, but it means he is simply other in the sense he is in a higher order of anything else in the universe. So that's why he can be sovereign over everything. But you need to balance that with the next one, imminent. Although he is not identified with his creation, that would be pantheism, uh, he is present in every part of creation. So yes, God is sovereign over all, but God is right here on the carpet with us too because he cares uh, for us. Omniscient, God's knowledge is timeless, immediate, and total. Has it ever dawned on you that nothing has ever dawned on God? Pretty amazing. Uh, we could also add here the other three omnis of classical Christian teaching. Uh, he is omnipotent and he is omnipresent. Nine, he is immutable. His character and purposes are not subject to change of any kind. Again, this does not mean that God is just some rock out there uh, that's just stationary, etc. But it does mean he is constant, consistent, and dependable. So he, it's not like today he's having a bad day because his breakfast was too cold, the coffee was weak, whatever. So he's going to just blast somebody for it. No, no. He is dependable. As he told, as, as Malachi says, uh, I am the Lord, I don't change. Or as James says, there is no shadow of turning with the Lord. He's holy. This Old Testament, or this biblical word has two connotations. Uh, one is separateness or otherness. God is in a class all by himself. So when God calls us to be holy people, he's not calling us to be gods in a class other than what we are. But when he calls us to be holy, it's ethically in the sense of moral perfection. 
God has no moral flaws, weaknesses, blemishes, shortcomings, or disabilities. And think of what a contrast that is just with these pagan nations who are all around Israel, whose gods and goddesses engaged in all kinds of immoral activities. And that was okay. It was kind of like, if you will, the gods would say, do what we say, not what we do, because we're ungodly just like you are. It's not the way God is. He says, be just like me because I'm ethically perfect. Loving, not simply that God loves, but have you ever noticed the biblical statements say God is love? In other words, that's his very essence. That's the very uh, core of his being. But of course, it is not sentimental mush because some people would say, oh, God is, God is loving, God is love, so therefore I can do what I want and he'll love me anyhow. No, no. The Bible always says genuine love means you obey everything he says. Creator, Genesis 1.1 simply says God created everything that exists, time, space, matter. He used no pre-existing material, so we use the Latin expression creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. He simply spoke and it came into being. Real science will not contradict the biblical teaching on creation. And thus limited as it is to what is observable, measurable, and repeatable, science alone can never get at the ultimate facts. So when it comes to a thing like creation, whether you are a believer or an unbeliever, you have to say, I believe what I believe about origins because I have faith. And the, and the difference is, are you going to have faith in God, the one who did it and who is the only one there, or are you going to have faith in a very fallible human, uh, if they want to call it science? Because they have to believe what they believe by faith, just as we believe God created everything by speaking it into existence. Also note Genesis 1.1 denies all the principal false philosophies which men have propounded. Atheism, polytheism, fatalism, evolution, pantheism, and materialism. All right there. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Wow. One verse, few words. God just shot down every human man-think philosophical system right there to start. And then uh, 13, he's ruler. Psalm 97, 1, the Lord reigns. As we study the Bible, we find he reigns over individual humans, earthly authorities, international affairs, the natural world, and the spiritual world. History is his story, and the Bible continually displays his sovereignty and his omnipotence. But, as Blanchard said, God does have one radical limitation, which is, he, is that he cannot do anything inconsistent with his own nature. And finally, judge. There are more references in Scripture to the anger, fury, and wrath of God than there are to his love and tenderness. When the Bible speaks of God's anger, it uses words which show it to be the necessary, consistent, and personal reaction of his holiness. God is not angry with somebody because they wore pinstripes on a day they were supposed to be wearing plaid. Or God is not angry with somebody because he's having a bad day because somebody looked at him cross-eyed. No. God's anger and wrath is always based on his perfect character, a violation of his holiness. And so as J.I. Packer says, as our maker, he owns us. And as our owner, he has a right to dispose of us. In other words, he has a right to punish somebody for eternity. So that's one way we can, we can approach or we can have God think about God just by whenever some thought comes up or some way we're going to respond to something, to a, a daily thing, we, we need to go back and say, wait a minute, am I responding in a way that recognizes I believe God is ruler? I believe God is loving. I believe God is really creator. I believe, etc." And then the other way we can do it, and we could spend entire lessons, of course, on this, is to look at Bible passages where we see so many of these things. Psalm 103, what an incredible one chapter that talks about, especially in verse 8, and, and as you know, this was my grandfather Yoder's uh, favorite chapter in the Bible. That's why I, I love it dearly. Um, what, a, what an incredible chapter, especially verse 8, where it says, uh, it gives us those four key things about God's character. 
God is gracious and merciful, long suffering and abundant in covenant loyalty. Goes on to talk about God cares for us just as as a father pities and cares for his child. Uh, God forgives us our sins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, psalm 104, a great nature psalm where the psalmist just extols the power of God in nature, creation, his preservation of all things, the way he takes care of every animal, giving them food when they need it, giving them drink when they need it, giving them a hideaway between rocks when they need it. Um, Psalm 147, the Lord is the subject of almost every sentence, again, emphasizing creation and the grace of uh, and his graciousness. Isaiah 40, 12 to 31, you're very familiar with that, where Isaiah talks about, look at our God who measures the earth in the span of his hand. And he just walks through all these, a lot of these characteristics we, we, just, uh, we, we just looked at. And that's where as Dan read that passage. God can't be compared to anybody. Who are you going to liken to God? There's no other God that does these things. And then, of course, Job 36 to 41. You know how God blew Job out of the water when Job was like, well, I don't think God knows how to run the universe. If I could be, if I could be king for a day and run the universe, well, God had to put him in his place in a hurry and remind him, Job, if you're going to run the universe for a day, here are a couple of simple things you need to do even before the day begins. And I mean, Job, you know, well, maybe I can't run the universe today after all. And that was God's whole point. Job, you're just a human being. Let me do what I do best. And you just humbly walk with me, walk in the fear of God. So, hope you got your money's worth. Hope that's enough to meditate and mull over. But um, that's what we're, what we're talking about in this, in this series as we're thinking of the radical way the world, man think, looks at a subject. But the, the radical way a believer, as God works with his mind, also approaches the subject. Okay, Lord willing, next two Sundays, we'll be blessed by having some missionaries speak with us. Then we'll come back first Sunday of August, I guess, and plow some more ground. Lord bless you. Have a great week.